deal with Psalm number 62. separation from family, it is difficult, yet we understand your great blessings are always with us. We thank you for your love and kindness, for your great mercy, for your grace, and most importantly, for your salvation. 
We thank you always for Christ, and we pray that you will be a, a blessing to the family as they are grieving the separation from a loved one today. Guide us always in your service. This prayer we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have some comments from the family at this point. Christy has something I believe she wants to read from Thomas. And then Charles has something to read. So, as he said, this is from Thomas, which I believe we're Skyping with right now. <laughs> Hi, Thomas. <laughs> and um, he was able to come up last week. Um, right before Grandma passed away. And uh, anyway, so I'm going to read this for you. I was nervous to tell Grandma that I was moving away to grad school. I figured she'd tell me I should stay, that there were fish here I could study. But she told me I should go, that I should follow my dreams, that I shouldn't wait any longer. I needed to hear that. It made it easier to be away, knowing that she understood that she would have done the same in my place. Grandma understood the need to go, to travel, to see new places. As her body failed her, that got harder and harder for her to do. But that didn't stop her from telling mom and dad they needed to take her with them every time they came down to see me in the south or on any of their other trips. The spirit, the passion, the feistiness, the love and protectiveness that made her such a wonderful grandma never left her. There were days when I wasn't sure if she knew exactly who I was, but she always knew I was one of hers. Grandma's chart at the manor had labeled her as wanderer, and she was. Whether she was traveling to Washington by train alone with her boys, or cruising the country with grandpa, or touring Spain, Hawaii, and branching with her friends, or gallivanting about the countryside with Ed, or attempting to follow Alex and I out of the manor and setting off the alarm, she loved to wander. <laughs> I got to be with her in her final days and moments, and she was ready to go again but was trapped in a body that had finally run out. Grandma got to go home to be free once more. We'll join her one day again, but as she well knew, we're a herd of turtles. And that was something she would always tell us. Well, we need to move like a herd of turtles. And both Thomas and I were, we got to be there and we were holding her hand when she passed away. And, you know, thank you. Family to make comments it wasn't just me and Christy. If there's others who have comments in there, uh, I'd like to read this. It's something Mom, Mom had wrote about her life, or what she remembered in her later years. So I'd like to share that to you. And you're going to hear it in two tenths. One, one is Mom saying, Mom's writing, and the next one, the latter part, is in my words. So if you hear I, that would be Mom. And then I pretty, pretty well with myself. I was born to Raymond Edward and Laura A. Feldman on June 8, 1926, at 2.30 p.m. at Grandma and Grandpa's, J.P. Feldman's home in Whitman County, out of Ferndale, Washington, on the Douglas Road. I had two brothers, Wesley Dale and Stuart Dan, who were six and three and a half years <clears throat> older than I. Some of my earliest memories are trying to ride old Sadie, the milk cow. Her backbone could almost cut you into pieces. Another memory was playing cowboys and outlaws with rubber bands. Believe me, you knew when you'd been shot. <laughs> we three kids all had horses to ride. Mine was too young to me, and me too. I'd started, I'd, I'd not started school as yet. Chum had not been broken to ride, but I'd sneak out to the pasture behind the house lead her up to the bob wire fence and climb her back, clench my knees and put a good hold on her mane and say, giddy up. And off she'd run and go under all the low apple tree branches. She was trying to brush me off and I was yelling for daddy and Chucky, a hired man. Help, help. And they'd run out from wherever they were. Also mom and the two boys would come and I'd do this several times before dad's sober. When I did go to our two-room school, East Mount View, we'd ride on the boys' horses every other day. 
I'd be behind one or the other. Little sisters could be with real pain. I was a sickly first grader. Our closest neighbor was mother's sister and family, Beulah and Carl Hunter, while S and Patrice J were their two little kids. Uncle Carl brought <coughs> old, old cars. And you got to remember, this was a long time ago, so she said, old, oh, old. Oh. I bought an old, old car. Bud bought an old, old car so that Bud, Rob, could drive us five miles to school in the winter. He was 11 years old at the time. <laughs> there weren't enough students to keep the school open, so after that, we walked most of the time three miles to catch the school bus into Ferndale for school. After an unusual big snow, Dad would hitch up the horses and make them to a makeshift sled and would take the milk to wherever the truck could come and pick up the milk cans. Ten gallon ones, I think. Then, when it would thaw, there'd be high tide and it would flood the flats. Then we'd get to go to stay with Grandma and Grandpa. They had electric lights. One was dangling from the middle of the room. It was wonderful. Grandma had a big, thick, soft feather mattress to sleep on. It felt like I'd seen it forever in it. Mom and Beulah would draw straws on who would stay and cook for the men. We lived on the Lummi Indian Reservation until I was around in the middle of fourth grade, and then we moved up to the buyer's place in the wagon. I went to West Mountain View School, then to junior high in Ferndale, and to high school I graduated in May 1945. One night in wintertime, I woke up very cold and wet. I was at least three or four years old, and I called out, Daddy, Daddy. And when he and Mother woke up and asked me what was the matter, I told them how cold I was. Of course, Dad said, come on in bed and I'll warm you up. So I crawled in bed and snuggled up and Dad gasped, oh, Lord, she's wet. And Mother giggled and said, of course. <laughs> We were invited over to great grandpa and great grandma families. And great great grandma Van in Van Wyck, which is out of Burlingham. It seemed like such a long way to go for a Sunday dinner. Great great grandma was a short, heavy set lady, and she gave me a lovely mother of pearl film purse. It's been lost all these many years. She came from Kentucky, and I don't know when. So did my grandpa's parents. He, Grandpa J.P. family, was born in Worth County, Missouri, while they were going west to Seattle and Birmingham, traveling by horseback. We kids had a wonderful time playing with our two cousins, Marion and Bob Kelly. Their dad was Grandpa's youngest brother, Wendell. My grandma, Ella Erskine Boston family, was born in Maine and went to Yorktown, South Dakota, before they moved to Ferndale, Washington. One summer, Mom and Dad and we three kids took a trip across the mountains to visit Mom's brother, Uncle Chad, Aunt Louise, and Charlie, Cheryl, and Neil. They lived in Winthrop, Washington, on a farm with an irrigation company in the The ditch ran through the farm, and we had so much fun jumping back and forth over it. That is until I missed and jumped in with my shoes. Oh, what was me? I just knew I'd really catch it. But was just told to be more careful. I was nine or ten years old at the time. Some of the time at Christmas, we'd go to Dad's sister. And I met the Christmas dinner. She'd have the table set so beautiful with the big blue mirror loaded with fresh fruits for a sandwich <coughs> and crystal and china and silver with a white tablecloth and apples. I remember when they told me they were going to have a baby and I'd have someone to play with. At last, I thought. George was a premature baby, and I was so disappointed when I finally got to see my brother. He was in an incubator and only weighed such a little bit. Aunt Nina sure laughed at my expression. I had not thought about that, and I was at least seven years old then. George eventually grew to be over six, seven, six, six. <laughs> Later after that, he was a few years old, and we'd go out in the yacht, the Argonaut. Ever, his dad, George, built it, and it was a really good boat for the times. Old Settler's Picnic was, and still is, a yearly celebration that was started before Mother was born in 1897, and which we all look forward to. 
everyone from miles around would come too. Lots of people who had moved away still come back for it. They had races for little kids, and everyone got something. Or maybe just I did. His grandpa was the judge for the races. He asked me why I didn't run faster, and I'd always answer, but grandpa, I run better behind. I always got a nickel. Long before I was old enough to go to school in the springtime, Daddy was plowing the field getting ready for the oats. I had on boots, one of my brothers, and I would sit in the furrow and wait for Dad to stop and give me a ride. He had to stop. I was in front of the horses. They dropped their head to smell me, nudged me a little, and Dad would set me on the flat and hold me on while he walked a little way before setting me down. One Christmas, I was given a toy, a store, a store set, little big boxes of groceries, and even a little counter and shelves. I don't remember why, but I took them out to the old chicken house, and I set my store up. And after playing for a while, I started to hit. Of course, into the house I ran, covered with chicken leaves. Mother shooed me out of the house, stripped me down to my mother's and bathed me and shampooed me until all those fleas were gone. I don't even remember getting my toys out of the chicken house. <laughs> Bev's brother, Stuart, was in the Navy during World War II. Stuart Dayton Quayle served on the USS Indianapolis and was killed when a ship went down in the South Pacific. Wesley Dale Whalen was in the Army and he was in the Battle of the Bulge. This was his first and last battle as he was hit with shrapnel during battle, but survived. I, I put that in there before we could really understand the, the life of that generation of what they went through. And I'm not, not even talking about the depression or just that. What each and every one of that generation went through. Beverly graduated from Ferndale High School in 1945. That worked at Linden Mutual Ferndale Corporation. Off and on, as her family went to California or Wickenburg, Arizona, because of her dad, Raymond's asthma, she would pay part of the way until her marriage. Beverly was married in 1947 to 1948, and Michael Stewart was born on August 5, 1947. Beverly moved to Seattle, Washington, and lived with her cousin, Elaine Raymond, and worked as a switchboard operator. Bev lived there four or five months. Then she met James and Kim on a blind date set up by her cousin Elaine and Tom, Jim's brother. Tom and Elaine were dating at the time and Jim and Beth met on November 1951 and were married on February 10, 1952. Charles was born in November 23, 1952. The family moved to Little Rock in October of 1953. Raymond was born on January 15, 1955, and then moved to Topeka, Kansas, October 1956. James Andrew was born on January 18, 1956. And after the kids were out of the house, and there's so many stories about that that I can't be here too long. <laughs> So after we kids were out of the house, Jim and Deb went through four RVs, two cabin fixer uppers at Truman Lake. Mom had itchy feet and liked new places and experience. Jim died April 3, 1997, at the age of 69. 1997 to 2005. After Jim's death, Mom's itchy feet didn't go away. She moved back to Topeka from Texas on a rental on Kansas Avenue. Group number one. Then she moved to an apartment off 29th and Gage. That was move number two. Move number three was to a one-bedroom apartment at Hunter's Ridge on the north side of Topeka. And move number four to a bedroom apartment in the same complex. Mike and I were getting really weird. <laughs> During that time, Bev went to Spain, Hawaii twice, and the state of Washington to her sister-in-law on her 90th birthday with Charles and Benny Benny. And then again with Charles and Benny in 2003 to visit <coughs> her friends. She also went with Charles and Peggy twice to the Midwest Bible camp out. 
2002, mom was baptized into our Lord's church. And she was 75 years old at that time. It's never too late. In September 2005, Mom and Ed Montour got married. She moved into Ed's house on Monroe, another move. <laughs> then, then Ed's two sons, Ed Jr., California, and Steve Montour, who's here, of Topeka. Ed was a pack master for Charles's Cub Scout Club, and both Ed Jr. and Steve went to Seaman along with Bev's four boys. Steve and Charles had worked several jobs together and also graduated from Seaman High School in the same class. Mom still had itchy feet. Mom and Ed, Charles and Peggy and Thomas went to Washington for a family reunion <coughs> on Mom's dad's side of the family. That itself is another story. Mom and Ed traveled to Wisconsin several times to visit Ed's side of the family and to Arizona to visit Ed Jr. a number of times. And they also traveled the great state of Kansas. They may not have known where they went, <laughs> but somehow, by the grace of God, they got back safe. Again, another story. In 2009, Beverly and Ed moved into Presbyterian Man. The move was their choice. However, Mike and I had to remind Mom several times that she and Ed had made that choice on their own. As time passed, they went from independent living to assisted living, another move, then to long-term care, another move, and during that time, the manor, and during that time at the manor, they had another family. And that was the staff at the manor for, for them. We are so thankful for their care and their loving kindness to our family. During this time, driving for them needed to be stopped. Mom did give her license voluntarily. I took her. Though later she didn't remember doing so. And then their van needed work. <laughs> Steve took the van to get it repaired. And to my knowledge, it is still being repaired. <laughs> At least that is the story where Mike and I told Mom. That made Steve the bad guy. <laughs> and for that, Mike and I and Jamani are very great. <laughs> Ed died July 24, 2017. Mom was moved to a private room and was in there till her death on April 19, 2018. This is her greatest move, as she is now with her Lord and Savior. Mom, we will sorely miss you. Have a wonderful return. Oh, that's me. 
there were hard times. And I remember my mom saying, and my dad, you know, times were hard, but everybody else was in the same boat. That's just the way it was. There's no point in feeling sorry about it. It's just life. And that's kind of the way our life is, isn't it? It's just life. We make of it the best that we can. We have responsibility for doing those things that God would have us do. And we do the best we can with what we can. It is hard to think of being separated from someone we love. There is pain and an emptiness that can't be filled. When we think of the loss of a mother, this is indeed one of the most difficult things that we can think of. I can tell you from experience, the pain will go away. The emptiness will not. And I think that's the way it should be. There is a lot of comfort that I can offer you today. I'll share two statements that um, Brother Dan shared with us at a meeting a year or so ago that I think are really helpful for me. One was, we don't bury people with the empty home of their spirit. And I think that's important for us to understand. <coughs> Bev is no longer in that box. She's not with us. She's not bound in a frail body that is giving away. She is free. Her spirit is free. And it is perfect. She's no longer in pain. And that is a great blessing and a comfort to each and every one of us. John 14, 1 through 7. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are my mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. And whether I go, you know the way you go. Know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. How can we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If he had known me, you should know my Father. And also from henceforth ye know him have seen him. I go to prepare a place for you. When we think of going home, you know, that's an interesting concept. Those sons can no longer go to their home. That is not their, that is not their home. Any of you who have lost family know that is something you struggle with. We have a great affinity for the place where we lived. When we talk about moving so many times in our life, any of you that have moved, it's a traumatic experience to leave a home. I don't know why that is. Doesn't seem like it should be, but it is. We go, we become accustomed to our home. And we're comfortable there and we like it there and we want to stay there. Yet even when we find a better <coughs> home, we often think of our old one. My mother passed away about a year and a half ago. The farm that I grew up on, I hadn't been there in 40 years to live, maybe longer. But it was still home. We sold that farm in October of last year, and I often find myself thinking of the fact I can no longer go home. Yet we know we have a home prepared, much more splendorous than any home we will have here. We can go home, and we look forward to that home, each and every one of us. When we gather at times like this to say goodbye to loved ones, for those of us who have faith and understand what that home is that is prepared for us, this gives us great comfort. It is hard for me to imagine 
someone going through this experience that does not have that faith. The loss of a loved one, that separation that has no meaning, and that person who is not going to a home that is prepared to be. It is a difficult thing to understand. Yet for a Christian, we do have that understanding, that comfort, that great home that is prepared for us. Hebrews 9, 27. And is it appointed unto men once to die, and after this to judgment? Very simple statement. When we think of life, from the day we are born, we are God. Really that simple. It's what our life, the end of our life will be in this world, is death. And after that death, there will be a judgment. That is true for each and every one of us. There is no escape. What makes a difference is what we do with that life. In this case, we know that Bev had dedicated her life to our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no greater thing that can be done with your life than to have that understanding. There is no greater choice that we can make. First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even of others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we be with the Lord forever. <coughs> when we think of our life, we think of our death, we think of the purpose of our life. What is it? Is it, as some people say, the man who has the most toys wins? Is that what life is about? There are people who believe that. Yet what comfort do they have? What do they understand about the life to come? Indeed, there is a Lord and Savior. There is a home prepared. And indeed, there is comfort for us. Another quote from Dan. For Christians, we don't say goodbye, but farewell till we meet again. Goodbye. Which would you rather say today to bed? Goodbye or farewell till we meet again. Bev's body has failed as all of ours will, but her spirit has gone home. Are you prepared for this inevitable event in your life? When we think again about life and ultimately death, it is something we need to prepare for because it will happen. Whether you're ready or not, it will happen. 
And we need to understand we need to be prepared. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? That is one question each and every one of us must ask. It is God's desire that each and every one of us be saved. To make the choice that they did to be baptized, even if the water is cold. Because it's important. And it's a choice that we need to make. That verse tells us that we have the opportunity to not perish. When we think of eternity, just as there is in life, we have choices. We have choices now to choose whether we will serve the Lord or not. Every day, every hour, every minute of our life, we make choices. And it's based on those choices that we will be judged. The Lord indeed wants us not to perish. He wants us to have the opportunity to have that mansion He has prepared for us. But that choice is ours. Based on how we live our life. When we remember Bev, it's hard not to think of her humor. And I think that's good. I believe she would want us to remember her that way. <coughs> but she also made the choices that were necessary in her life to serve her Lord and Savior. I believe I know her well enough that I can say she would have the desire that all of us that she loved today would make that same choice. She would want all of her family to be in that home prepared for her. I'll bring my thoughts to a close. Brother Dwayne has a reading for us. Be reading from Revelation 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. No more pain for bed. No more sorrow for her. The things of this life passed away. She has passed on to be with God. Then one of the seven angels <coughs> who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a precious stone, a most precious stone, like jasper, 
clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, its length is as great as its breadth, and he measured the city with a reed twelve thousand furlongs, its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall one hundred and forty four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of the wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth, sardonyx, the sixth, sardius, the seventh, chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, chrysophase, the eleventh, jacinth, and the twelfth, amber. <coughs> the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. A picture from Revelation of where Bev is. Bev loved bright colors. She loved precious stones. I'm sure she's enjoying the sight. What a sight to behold as we contemplate the picture of heaven presented to us by the Apostle. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again as we approach thy throne of mercy, we're being grateful for the many blessings that we so richly receive from you. At this time of separation from Bear, we thank you for the comfort that we get from the understanding of the great blessings that you have given us in the home that is prepared. We pray that you would be with the family now and give them comfort in that understanding. Give them the desire to serve you always in their life. Pray that indeed you will guide us and protect us always in that service. This prayer we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Number 361. This world is not my own, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are in all And I can't feel at home in this world. 